What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLP FM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archive at madnessradio.net. Thanks for tuning in to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And uh, today we're doing a show on meditation and madness. And we have um, Ed Knight uh, with us. He's calling from uh, Colorado. And Ed is uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. He has lived in the streets and been institutionalized. And then he went on uh, through his own process of recovery to become an advocate um, and organizer in uh, the consumer recovery movement, working with patients and ex-patients um, to make changes in the mental health system. He started the Mental Health Empowerment Project in New York State and um, in the early 90s was a pioneer in getting hundreds of groups started and really leading um, the recovery movement in the U.S. and internationally. He now works with uh, Value Options, which is a behavioral managed care company, as a trainer and educator and works on changing mental health policy around the country. Um, Ed is also an accomplished uh, meditator uh, in the Zen, Insight, Theravadan Buddhist, and Centering Prayer Christian traditions. So thanks a lot for joining us today on Madness Radio, Ed Knight. Hi, how are you doing? I, uh, I'm glad to be here talking about um, transforming uh, delusions into enlightenment. Yeah, it's great to have you back. You were on the show, I guess, about a year ago. We had an opportunity to talk about your story and, and your work really in depth, and I encourage people to check out on the Madness Radio website, madnessradio.net. Um, look up Ed Knight um, with a K, K-N-I-G-H-T, for that show we did last year. And I was really interested in that show to do another show uh, focusing on meditation. And I know that you're a very experienced uh, meditator, and we've talked quite a bit about this and maybe we can just start out by um how is it that um you sort of got into the mental health system what sorts of experiences led you to a diagnosis of schizophrenia and living on the streets and and then how you kind of turned your whole experience around to become an organizer and um and leader today uh, sure uh <clears throat> i began uh, i got i began hallucinating in 69. Uh, I was, my first wife had died of cancer at 25. I was, uh, was the first week on a new job in the South, in a new area of the country. Um, and um, you got to remember 69 was, was uh, the South was still fairly uh, uh, disrupted. And uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, kind of social chaos. Uh, um, and um, there was also the Vietnam War going on, so it was it was really um, um, a tremendous number of stressors. And um, I began um, being pounded internally by a phenomena of of uh, what uh, psychiatrists call uh, um, voices. I don't think that's a very precise term because it covers a lot of different experiences. I thought I was reading people's minds and people were reading my minds. Occasionally I had experiences which seemed to verify that, but uh, um, I then uh, being was put on medication and I started meditating in the, in, uh, in the Taoist tradition, studying Tai Chi, uh, and then in the Sufi tradition. And I kept on, I was working, I hadn't finished my PhD, but I was working as an assistant professor and um, kept on having breaks and ending up in the hospital. And uh, finally, in 79, I ended up in the streets and was either in the streets or institutionalized until 88, 87, excuse me, 87. But while I was institutionalized, I began very intensely uh, uh, meditating um, I was um, basically, I was having a panic attack, and uh, the person on duty uh, said, it was a weekend, said, well, I'm not your regular therapist, and if you're not a danger to yourself or others, then um, I can't do anything for you. You have to, you know, you just have to figure out what to do. In response to that, I intensified my meditation practice, which I had learned. I, I, I was doing concentration exercises on an object external to me with my eyes 
open and then closing in my eyes and pulling the object into my uh, imaginary field of vision, which strengthens the, the concentration tremendously. And so I began analyzing, or I began, re, um, I should say, um, finding the elements of anxiety in my body um, and the various sensations. Kind of like itch, um, you can notice the itch if you don't scratch it. it is little burning sensations and, and little tingly things, and they're always changing. Well, you can do the same thing with anxiety. So you were um, doing this kind of ex- you were doing this kind of experimenting while you were in a yeah. psychiatric hospital. Yeah, right. And I, I was not being treated for anxiety, and they refused to to do anything, um, and just let me suffer it through. So my response was to do something about it. Um, I also found myself really very hopeless and wanted to kill myself. And so I found three different ways, and I was on my way to, to do to, to, to do that. And I stopped and prayed. Uh, I, I just stopped and I said, help. And uh, it was an authentic prayer um, because I, 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 there was no concepts involved. I wasn't, I wasn't really... Um, um, make it, I don't know, it's just a concept. There was a concept with image of this prayer. It was just a prayer to a, a, a higher power, so to speak, to help me. Um, and the pain was so bad I couldn't take it. The next day the pain went down enough to get out of my bunk, and um, I figured that was an answer to my prayer, and I made a promise to uh, help all people who were helpless in the, in, through mental afflictions um, and proceeded to do that. Um, so you were in the hospital as a result of having these voices, experiences, and, and but that was, and, and was and suicidal feelings, and that was really interfering with your work as a professor and, and being in the world and functioning in the world? Was that oh, yeah, why you were... Yeah, I couldn't function. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't keep it together. I mean, I, well, I would have periods in which I was so internal, I couldn't hear people. Um, and you can't exactly, it was, you know, it would be called hysterical deafness, but I, I simply couldn't function. Or, or I would become so disorganized, I'd try to go from one geographical place to another, and I'd never get there, because I was so disorganized. Um, um, and uh, so my thought processes were so chaotic. In 79, though, I did finish my dissertation and get my PhD. Um, so in the midst of all this going on, I would have periods when I was functional. Um, Which is an important thing for people to understand because um, there's this there's this kind of myth or stereotype that someone who has a schizophrenia diagnosis, they're always in these extreme crisis states, whereas actually, I mean, your experience and also my experience has been going in and out of states, and sometimes you're more extreme, sometimes you're more lucid, and you just have this ongoing kind of struggle with these waves of um, madness or these waves of intensity that you go through. Yeah, actually, Edward Podvall, who's uh, now deceased, uh, he's a he's a doc, he's a medical he's a psychiatrist who wrote a book called. Um, it was first called the Seduction of Madness, then it was reissued as Recovering Sanity by Shambhala Press, and. He talks about there's always islands of clarity between psychosis, and the um, the practice is to try to connect the islands of clarity, so there's more clarity and, and less confusion. Um, and I have found meditation to be extremely helpful in that way. Um, as I was saying, the, with the anxiety, I was able to um, learn to tolerate it by experiencing its millions of constituent components um, and its constantly changing nature. So you kind of turned your symptom into an object of meditation study. Yeah, I I would not say mental object. It's more like, let me give you an example. If If you hold your hand up in front of your face and stare at your hand, you can kind of detach and treat your hand as an object. Or you can put your hand down at your side, close your eyes, and just feel, participate in the sensations in your hand, feel the sensations in your hand. That's the internal inside view, or that's participating in your own hand as a part of you. And viewing your hand as an object, 
as an ex, something external to you is the external view of the outside view. That kind of outside view, um, if you if you treat anxiety as something like that and try to push it away, you'll actually increase it. You get into what I call aversive cycles. So um, it, it sounds very counterintuitive, but you need to get into the anxiety and find out that it's not all that frightening. Um, to experience it more to, fully and to actually um, feel the sensations um, to the extent that you can rather than just pulling away from it or trying to push it push it away from your experience, which is natural, which is what we all do, I think. So and it was so this real experience of having the um this experience of having the anxiety lessen as a result of your meditation really helped you to cultivate and develop meditation as an important tool for your wellness. Did it help you get out of the system? And then when did you stop being in the hospital and when were you able to start um being back sort of in the world again? Seven, I, I uh, got out of the hospital and I got married. And in '88, I got a job with the uh, the, uh, um, the Health Association of New York State and uh, started the Mental Health Recipient Empowerment Project. And then a few years later, we spun off as the Mental Health Empowerment Project. Um, I, I, I want to correct something though. I, I, it, for a number of years, it wasn't that anxiety lessened. And I, I, I would I would sometimes use uh, medications to uh, to uh, deal with the anxiety. Um, and I'm not anti-medication. I don't see anything wrong with using them. It's just that they're overused so tremendously. But then, um, then I learned to tolerate. I think it's more like tolerate a ride through intense anxiety uh, rather than, than take medication because I noticed the medication was was like. Uh, Making my, it was like freezing the anxiety. It wasn't taking it away, and I would have had to keep on taking more and more and more medication to deal with it. So it wasn't that the anxiety lessened exactly. It was that I learned to ride through it without being frightened of riding through it. So I ceased having a feedback loop of fear of fear. I would experience fear and then ride through it rather than fearing the fear and building a cycle that would keep on building. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've had that experience um, myself. Just it's a way of, of kind of creating a a sort of detachment to the experience so that you're able to explore it and um, not be running away from it or reacting to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, aversion or running away from experiences generally makes them worse. That's why I think um, I don't really use any cognitive behavioral therapy techniques because in cognitive behavioral therapy you you have an automatic thought and then you try to counter it with another thought. Well that just builds a, a complex thought system but it gives energy to that system of thoughts. And actually very often those kinds of techniques increase, they don't decrease anxiety. And that's from the from research literature. So um, it's um, it's more important to cognitively distance yourself from your thoughts than it is to try to substitute a new thought for the old thought. How did you start getting involved in recovery um, organizing? So you, you had this experience where you dedicated yourself to the commitment um, to, to the healing of other um, people who were experiencing mental suffering. But when was that moment when you started to actually do organizing? When did you make that step? Well, <laughs> I started in the hospital. Um, I organized. We were having uh, the um, people who delivered food had a slowdown strike, a slowdown, a work slowdown, and the food was arriving very late. And I was kind of a natural leader on the ward I was on, and people were coming to me, telling me they were getting diarrhea and upset stomachs, and. So I sent them to the psychiatrist instead of a medical doctor because the psychiatrist was a very sympathetic guy. And uh, nothing was done. And so I organized the ward and called a hunger strike. Um, we, we refused to go eat. And, um, of course, that got, that got me heavy labels for doing that in the institution. But actually, in the, news, in the local newspapers, three elderly people had died from food poisoning uh, at, in, the, in this incident. 
so there was some danger involved, and uh, um, I um, ended up staying a lot longer in the hospital than I would have, but they also said somebody um, who, who I had helped get hired, I, I had helped the the African-American guys on the, on the ward bring a lawsuit that, that brought the first African-American psych, uh, social worker into the hospital, and she was assigned to ride with the food vans to see if the food was getting cold, and indeed it was. And so um, that's really, really, that's when I began organizing. It, it, I, it, in mental health, I had been trained as a community organizer on the west side of Chicago in the African-American ghetto, a um, very poor place, um, uh, and in uh, in the in the mid '60s, that that actually was a part of the reason I, I had a break was that intense experience. Um, but um, and then you went on to I organize started. a hunger strike in the hospital that ended up improving yeah. conditions, which were which were extreme, with um, people actually yeah. getting sick and some people even dying from the quality of the of the food that's really an amazing amazing story so you actually started organizing the system while you were still in the hospital you were still in the system i I had a phd in sociology and i wrote an an anthropological i guess i was trained as a as a uh in community studies which is like urban anthropology even though my degree is in sociology and so i began studying the hospital and i wrote a report and was appointed the human rights advocacy committee and um the report ended up in the uh, in the uh, um, legislative in the legislative files. It was read in the legislative files. And years later, I met the uh, the head of the hospital at the time, and he I was giving a speech, and he said, uh, "Don't ever think that period of your life was lost." I took that report and implemented four of the five changes you suggested. Um, and so I want you to know you helped transform the hospital. Then when I got out, I, I got a job organizing in uh, in New York. Um, so it was kind of started in the hospital, you know. And so what about today, Ed? I know your your life is very busy. You're doing a lot of, of talks, and um, meditation is really a big part of your life um, as well. What kinds of meditation techniques um, do you do now, and how do you feel that they help you? Because it sounds like you're still um, experiencing these different or voices or, or, or psychic um, experiences that, that would be considered schizophrenia or, or psychosis. So um, how, how does it all fit together for you today? Um, yeah, I still use meditation. I wouldn't say I experience psychosis at this point. I, I distance myself from from what uh, in the Buddhist tradition are called mental fabrications, or in uh, what uh, in the center and prayer tradition, what um, Father Keating calls the false self. I think um, um, I, uh, I I would I do zazen at this point and centering prayer. In zazen, Dogen originally defined it, the founder of Japanese Zen. Uh, Dogen originally defined it as uh, think non-thinking. How do you think non-thinking, not thinking? That is the essential art of zazen. So I think uh, letting go of, of mental uh, uh, Jack Cornfield said um, something interesting once. He said, uh, uh, as a rule of thumb, nothing is worth thinking about. Um, within the, the whole Buddhist framework, and really, if you look carefully within the Christian framework, um, every single experience we have in human life is what in the West we call ineffable. It can't be named. It's beyond concepts and words. So we live all the time in an infinite universe. Um, Buddha said, um, upon his enlightenment, uh, wonderful, wonderful, everything just as it is, is already enlightened. And St. Paul, when he was talking about his experiences of Christ, said the fullness of Christ is present in everything, in every way. Um, and so when you when you allow yourself to drop mental fabrications of any kind um, and live in a space of what my Zen teacher Bernie Glassman calls not knowing, 
in that space, there's, there's an, an immediacy of experience and an ineffability of experience that, uh, that uh, um, allow one um, a lot of mental clarity and really um, um, increase one's um, ability to endure uh, and to uh, face rough situations, whether they be internal or external. So tell us about the practice um, of Zazen itself. Just what does it actually look like? What does it entail? How does someone actually do it? Well, I study in a, I study with Bernie Glassman. And I, he, you know, when you study with a great master like Bernie, he's so busy, you, he, he usually asks you to study with one of his students. So I'm currently studying with a friend of mine, Ken, Ken Bayel, and checking in with Bernie. But, um, Zazen with Bernie is non-thinking. It is not knowing. Um, you can formally sit in, in uh, a, a, a posture of, of the beginner's posture or, or, or half lotus or full lotus with a spine erect and sitting on, on your haunches and then on, uh, uh, leaning forward slightly so you're, you're uh, balanced uh, in, like on a triangle of your, of your pubic bone and your, and your two hip bones. Um, and uh, your your hands in the cosmic mudra, which is your hands um, are in, are together, forming a circle uh, with your thumbs at the top and your fingers at the bottom. But and then you then you basically participate in your breath. I hate to say watch your breath because you you become one with your breath when you do this long enough, um, and your breath ceases to be an object, um, which is something I tried to describe earlier. But um, the um, the practice of non-thinking is not stop is not stopping your thoughts. It's constantly letting go of the story you're involved in, whether whether you think it's a true story or not. Essentially, all story is all concepts are abbreviations. They're about the past. They're static. They don't capture the constantly changing, ineffable nature of the reality around us. And uh, um, nirvana, nibbana, in Zen is uh, being in contact with things that we actually are, rather than with concepts or ideas of them. So uh, I think um, that participating in the breath and constantly letting go of story as it arises, because story arises all the time. And so you let that go and return to your breath. After a while, you begin noticing mental, mental fabrications and letting go of them during your daily life. And you, you see, for example, um, I may do an analysis of the mental health system because I, I find uh, a, uh, a lot of what mental health does, the mental health systems, mental illness industry, I should say, does is... Uh, is really function as the normative aspect of our society and the attempt to manage uh, people in order to make them more productive. It's kind of an industrial model of mental health. And uh, But I let that story go when I'm dealing with uh, mental health professionals or when I'm, when I'm dealing with myself. I, it, the reality is rich, constantly changing, and I don't want to grab on to a story and, and make it as if it's the only reality. You also mentioned but, insight, meditation, and um, centering prayer. Now, centering prayer, I don't know that much about it, but it comes out of the, uh, the Christian tradition, and I, I we, we tend to think yeah. of meditation as Eastern, Hinduism, yoga, Buddhism, but actually Christianity yeah. also has a, a, a meditation practice tradition within it. Yeah. Tell us about that and how you do that. Yes, okay. Um, uh, well, um, Centering prayer is uh, really centering your attention on uh, God and uh, allowing allowing that God will will um, will change you um, or will participate in the change process with you. Um, and I, I, I kind of mix that with bhakti yoga. I, I, it's a devotional practice. Uh, they're very similar practices, bhakti yoga and centering prayer. I focus my attention really on uh, on um, 
God, but it's hard to say what that is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, because God doesn't like like manifest to us in a particular way usually. So um, um, it's like it's like uh, focusing on a point in empty space with the intention toward God. And then I use a word, a sacred word, uh, but it's not a mantra. Whenever I start to drift off, I will use the word Abba or Father uh, the, uh, to return. Uh, to, uh, the uh, um, uh, um, centering word helps you return your, your attention to uh, to God. And uh, so the uh, the word is not repeated all the time, but just when you begin to drift off to, to kind of reaffirm your, your intention. Uh, and that, uh, that, of course, enriches the practice of Zazen because Zazen is non-thinking. And so I don't get involved in a lot of verbal constructs. I just am silent uh, when I pray or when my intention is on uh, divinity. Um, and I take um, Abba as my as my guru, as my teacher. So my main teacher really is is Abba, the father, uh, or mother also, not to exclude mother in this. Um, um, Ima is the uh, Hebrew word for the equivalent of Abba. Abba and Ima often pray, um, or Abba, Ima. Um, but uh, the not knowing the aspect of Zen helps with the centering prayer, the centering, the teachings uh, of centering um, help with the zazen, with keeping your attention on your breath and and allowing mental constructs and mental fabrications or thoughts or story to just pass away. And what sorts of help does this offer you in your in your life and sort of um, navigating and, and um, promoting your own wellness? I have a problem with getting really, really angry at, at, at the mental illness industry. Um, and so um, I uh, am able to drop story and deal with the person in front of me. Um, that's a tremendous help. But beyond, I mean, that's like a, that's like a, an immediate first aid kind of thing. But beyond that, I think what, what's happened, if you, if, if, if you look over time, when I first became psychotic. One of my delusions was that I was going to disappear. I had tremendous fear of that. Um, and it wasn't that my body would disappear, it was that I would disappear. Then I ran into a Sufi when I was studying Sufism, and he said, that's really the experience of no self, which I'd never heard of. And he said, you ought to ease into it. I think you'll find you enjoy it. So over time, I began easing into the experience of, of feeling like I was going to disappear and noticed that I would become one with the situation. It was like what uh, what in Western science is called the experience of flow. And then as I got into that and eased into liking the experience of no self, I began studying insight meditation and formally learned about uh, that, that self is, is a delusion, is a construct we construct ourselves with, with our daily thoughts. This is this is mine, that's mine, this is me, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Those are all thought patterns, and when you release them, you, you enter into a, a space of awareness without really um, um, a construct of an ego. And um, then um, the, uh, the, the, the next step in this process was I learned from studying Dogen and studying in Zazen that um, the, um, the mind sometimes does somersaults, so that's a very disorienting experience. Um, you know, the fear of disappearing and the, uh, the disorientation I experienced was always defined by uh, the DSM-3, 4, four, whatever number I was under, as feelings of uh, unreality and depersonalization. Well, um, as I began to enjoy the mental somersaults of being disoriented mentally, I, I, the, the, the whole thing kind of blended, and I found out that that uh, um, the uh, symptom of feelings of depersonalization and unreality were what in the East is called uh, uh, life is a dream, 
and uh, experiences no self. Uh, so you so were I having think, experiences uh, that were you were thinking were mental pathologies or were illness or psychosis, but then you start to have a spiritual interpretation of them and you realize that they're the beginning of some kind of w awakening process or some kind of spiritual growth process. Is that right? Yeah, you could put it that way, except, except the thing is that the whole process from beginning to end is nothing but labels both the negative labels and the positive labels. And when you realize that and drop story to that level, then uh, then I think uh, that um, mental anguish diminishes and one is able to uh, function in quite a different way than one did before realizing that. Um, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but... Um, we were talking before about how um, there are a lot of spiritual practitioners, people who are, are getting interested in Buddhism and who are going to meditation retreats and studying with spiritual teachers who are also mental health professionals. It's actually Buddhism is actually very popular among mental health professionals. And, and maybe some of them would say, and I've actually talked with people who would say, well, it's actually really important to dis to differentiate very clearly between the pathological disease, illness-oriented experiences, and then true spiritual practice and true spiritual um, awakening. How, what would you say to that? I think that uh, it's a set of labels, and that um, actually in the delusions are the seeds of awakening. I think that people diagnosed with schizophrenia who have the kinds of disorienting experiences or, or voice experiences that I have and that other people have had are uh, experiencing states of confusion uh, that uh, instead of managing need to be investigated. Instead of, instead of managing somebody to achieve functionality in an industrial system, I think that the, the stance of of interest, discovery, or curiosity about those phenomena, even if they're very extremely painful, is a much more fruitful stance because I, mental life to me is composed of a lot of aversion loops where I, I mentioned one of them of fearing fear. Well, if I fear anger and I get angry at somebody, then I'm likely to have a panic attack. So these aversive loops um, are very, are not very helpful. And, um, one's attitude toward the mental phenomenon one has magnifies the mental phenomenon. So when one begins with a scary kind of thing of, I've got to manage this hearing voices thing, um, or I've got to manage this anxiety thing, and then you make an object out of them and you try to push them away, you're actually going to give energy to them and increase their power, like fear of fear. And so I think... Uh, Changing from very gently changing from this kind of aversive management approach of mental life to discovery and curiosity um, about the pain we're in, that subtle shift already brings relief. Uh, if you can just make that subtle shift from now, you know, this could sound uh, like I'm in, endorsing people being psychotic. Well, not at all, because that's just, I've been there. I, it's, uh, I don't want to go back there. It's a state of immense pain. And one of the things I do is take uh, small doses of medications to ma maintain my own um, uh, non-psychotic state. But I, I, I use many other management, I use many other um, uh, ways of dealing with and uh, discovering what's going on so that I, I don't end up being overwhelmed by anxiety or I don't end up being manic. Mania for me is largely, for example, driven by anger and, uh, and the excitement of anger. And um, so I have to watch my anger input. I don't watch TV. I don't read newspapers hardly at all. So if you ask me what Obama and Clinton are arguing about recently, I really don't know uh, because it would set off excite too much excitement and I'd begin to get mad. All these things are, you can become curious about in the sense of watching when they arise and watching when they pass away. And you can become very skillful at allowing them to pass away and, and at, uh, at uh, um, when
when one is with them, uh, cognitively distancing oneself from these experiences. Um, the self is, in, in the view of, of Stephen Hayes, who founded Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, the self becomes fused with its contents. So I think I am my thoughts. But, and we need to go through a defusion of saying, no, I am not my thoughts, um, uh, or cognitive distancing um, that, uh, that the, the practice is built in puts it as non-thinking. Um, and getting in that non-thinking space, which can be very scary itself. I mean, you know, people people want to know to give them certainty, so entering the not knowing space is a scary thing in itself. But the curiosity, the curiosity about mental phenomena that are causing you anguish is going to help with the derangement and reduce it tremendously. And um, mental health professionals who... Um, are afraid of these kinds of states and afraid of the liability they might experience, um, I don't think are very helpful in uh, in um, making the kinds of distinctions they do. Um, and let's talk sense? about, yeah, and let's talk about the question of discrimination in meditation retreats. This is an issue that um, I've been involved in and um, Freedom Center has been involved in and um, last year, I wrote an essay in uh, Turning Wheel, Turning Wheel Magazine, which is a journal of uh, a Buddhist journal of uh, in, it's a Turning Wheel Magazine, a journal of engaged Buddhism, and it was called the Freedom to Sit, welcoming people with psychiatric disabilities at Buddhist uh, retreats. And I talked about um, the experience that I had and other people had of being told, well, if you have bipolar disorder diagnosis or schizophrenia, you're you're not welcome here. Or we're going to give you a special interview with our therapist, or you have to have your permission of your doctor to come. And these kinds of discriminatory attitudes that make a lot of assumptions about what people's experience is just on the basis of them having a, a label or having a, a history. And, and what I've my experience has been is that some retreat centers do this. They ask those kinds of intrusive questions, and some just, just don't. They just don't um, ask those questions, and they accept anybody and they let people decide for themselves whether they're ready and they they um, allow people to make that decision um, based on their own understanding of their capabilities and their interests and so what what's your sense of, of that in the um, in the Buddhist world and the meditation world of that attitude of discrimination that often comes up well I, I practice you know, the, the, the mother house that I practice in with Bernie Glassman is called the house of one people and uh, when I when I began practicing with Bernie, I realized that that schizophrenia or bipolar illnesses or depression are as much the enlightened way as anything else. And um, actually, one of my sangha members, and when I was thinking this, came up to me and said, "You know, um, your your diagnosis of schizophrenia—that's the enlightened way." Um, and uh, so if you become curious about anything, um, if you become curious about uh, a, a hand that doesn't work and what you're going to do with it, or legs that don't work, for example, FDR became curious about his legs that didn't work, and look what he accomplished. His legs never did work, but in dealing with his legs, he ended up dealing with the, the suffering of a world, um, and so I think that uh, that uh, the enlightened way is not uh, this way uh, that that somebody says or that way that somebody says. It's it's what you're living right now, and what you're living right now when you open to it and investigate it um, is the enlightened way. So um, I'm I'm a part of a sangha that has. Um, mental health consumers or clients or whatever term you want to use as a part of the sangha. Um, and uh, um, we decide for ourselves um, how far we're going to go and what we're going to practice. Um, you know, I ask, I have asked Bernie for advice about things that I, I think are, are too stressful. Uh, and uh, 
kind of wonder what he has to say, but he's not directive. If I didn't ask him, he'd never tell me, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that, Ed. Well, that uh, raises an interesting question because there are dangers to meditation. I mean, I, I think that it's often portrayed as a relaxation technique, and it often, for a lot of people, does produce relaxation, but it's also very powerful. So let's talk a little bit about the side of it where there is a danger to going to a meditation retreat or getting into deep sure. meditation. Absolutely. There are, there are dangers. I would say that uh, that um, um, people can, when you experience the, the freedom of the unconditioned, you you are you are in a groundless place, uh, which can be extremely disorienting, and all of your stuff. If you sit long enough in in quiet in quiet in any kind of practice, um, whether it's a Christian centering prayer practice or zazen or insight meditation um, or a pranayama in the yoga tradition, if you if you if you do any of these intensely for long periods of time, you enter an unconditioned place. You lose you begin to lose conditioning. And as you lose conditioning, if you don't have ways of skillful means of orienting yourself, you can get in too deep. So if people are getting in too deep, I suggest they stop immediately and do something else. Um, and I also personally my own my own way of being I don't really want to go to a sangha that uh, is frightened of of uh, extreme states. So the sangha I'm a part of is not frightened of extreme states. And uh, and uh, um, the the the, uh, the the surrounding atmosphere and how people react to you can can magnify extreme states. So I think uh, I think uh, the uh, the uh, social atmosphere has a lot to do with with how with how you're going to react to uh, to the uh, extreme states. But yeah, when you when you watch your breath and let go of story, um, you enter very very deeply into primordial mind, um, and uh, that. Uh, um, in and of itself, can be very, very disorienting. Um, and if you if you feel tendencies to going there, you know, I see just stopping and, and having ways of grounding yourself, and having people you can you can talk with and contact. One of the things so, that you mentioned um, earlier was this experience that you had of of thinking that you could read other people's minds or you would know what they were going to say before they said it, and actually, it was true that these were actually something that wasn't just delusional. You were actually tapping in to some psychic ability or some paranormal um, capacity of the mind. And often uh, meditation practices are um, related to that. People can open up and stir and awaken those kinds of psychic abilities. Let's talk a little bit about that because I think that on the one hand, people can get scared of that when it when it starts to happen which because it can be very very freaky obviously um especially when people don't really believe you when you try and talk about it but also the other side of it is it can kind of be overwhelming in the sense that you start to feel special or you start to feel like you have some gift or some talent or ability that other people don't have and that suddenly you're the messiah or you're like this great spiritual leader and it becomes kind of an inflated power tripping sort of thing. So you, you, to talk talk about a little bit about that experience because I'm sure that you've yeah, my, seen that in people my, and, and dealt with that. Yeah, my experience is that uh, in the first place, uh, and I've talked with Bernie about this, but in the first place, we don't actually know that, that we know what somebody else knows. That generally doesn't happen. The closest I've come to that was I remember living with a Sufi when I, he took my wife and I in off the streets when we were uh, in New York. Um, and the uh, um, I, I remember thinking something, and I was curious about these phenomena. And so I said, um, he walked in and said the same thing I was thinking about. And I said, were you aware that I was thinking about that? And he said, no, things like that are just in the air. Uh, so I realized that because 
I was thinking something, and the person, or the person that said it didn't mean they were also aware that I was aware of it. Um, they were just the same, we were picking up the same thought, and he, as he put it, it's just in the air. I think, yeah, ego inflation is a great danger. Uh, a lot of times people get involved in channeling to feel special. Um, because they they have they have no other way of feeling special. That's a very dangerous kind of state to be in. Uh, it's an attachment to mental constructs or mental fabrications. And letting go of story means letting go of these phenomena as well as everything else, because they're just thoughts. Um, because a thought, because you think that something is disembodied, makes it no wiser than anything else. Um, uh, if you think you're channeling spirits, um, you know, uh, because because something is disembodied doesn't make it wise. Um, I, I, I think the only thing I want to channel is the, is the love of God, and then, not by thought, but, but in my actions. Um, the uh, great traditions, the great wisdom traditions all warn against things like we're talking about, Teresa of Via says these phenomena happen in the in the third in the third mansion of the soul. Um, um, Patanjali talks about them as as a part of this of the yoga powers that need not to be dwelt dwelt upon and need not to be gone into because they're a power trip. Um, I think uh, uh, um, Sri Chinmoy in some of his books talks about these are totally unimportant and distracting things from the real work of the spiritual path, which is love and compassion. Um, and uh, I know Hazard and I have kind of the Sufi tradition says young souls, if they get interested in these things, can be invaded and disoriented in very unhealthy ways. Um, um, all, of this, uh, in, all of the spiritual traditions warn against getting involved in these kinds of phenomena. And I think uh, that uh, they're, they're kind of trippy, and we think we're more than we are, and they're, they're, uh, they're very dangerous phenomena to fool with. So my stance was, even though what I decided to do after exploring these spiritual traditions, you know, I would I would think somebody something, and then somebody else would say it. Well, those were undeniable phenomena, but what I did was, and what I still do is abstain from engaging in those kinds of mental fabrications. Um, and so um, it really is a process of non-attachment to those kinds of phenomena, which is so important to the growth spiritually of, of anybody. Ed, we don't have a lot of time left, but I wanted to ask you, do you feel like the mental health system is becoming more, or the mental illness system, I uh, referred to it, the mental illness industry, um, is it becoming more open to spiritual perspectives like you're describing, and is it supporting people in taking a spiritual perspective uh, on their symptoms or the things that get called symptoms? You know, it, it really, yeah, actually, it, yeah, that's true. I think um, in a lot of ways we're regressing with the increased use of force, but in, in many ways the uh, the spiritual aspects of, of uh, what we're going through are being, I think, in a subtle way, are being more and more recognized. Um, and uh, I know at one center I work with, I've, I've uh, taught people meditation, and we've done some, uh, uh, some uh, brief studies, statistical studies, which show positive results. And the experience of the staff at that center, they want me to come back and teach more. Um, and I know in other places you run into uh, um, accepting the spiritual dimension of human life and not simply rejecting it as as, uh, as uh, unreal or as uh, just another form of, of craziness. Ed, give us uh, your email address and website and how people can get in touch with us. And if they want more information about meditation or meditation and um, experiences that get labeled schizophrenia or get labeled psychosis, what would be some recommendations of some books and resources that you would point people to? Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, my webpage is, is Professor Ed, one word, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-E-D dot com. Um, and I have a, a audio streamed meditation up there. 
and that's linked to another site that I have, recoverycircles.org. Um, I think um, if people are really interested in this question, um, um, I think the most basic text in insight meditation I could, I could recommend uh, is uh, um, by uh, uh, Jack Cornfield and Joseph Goldstein um, seeking uh, um, uh, seeking seeking the heart of wisdom. Um, I think that 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 was a very important book for me to work my way through. Uh, and um, I think um, another important book from a very different point of view is Bernie Glassman's Instructions to the Crook. Um, neither of these books talk about what we've talked about here. You'll have to figure most of that stuff out on your own until I come out with my book, because I'm writing a book on, the, uh, on this. I'm writing a book on Zen, and I'm not quite sure what to call it, probably to make the point clear to the widest audience, I'll probably call it uh, Zen and Mental Illnesses or something like that. But uh, um, there's, there's uh, a lot of practitioners who have experienced extreme mental states that get diagnosed. And so when you get into Sangha, you'll often run into other folks who have uh, similar issues that they're dealing with. And I think exchanging notes with those kinds of people who are both uh, experiencing a mental health diagnosis and are meditating can be really helpful. Um, I know I've picked up a lot of stuff from other meditators who experience uh, diagnoses. Ed Knight, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Oh, it's been great. You've been listening to an interview with Ed Knight. Uh, he is a pioneer in the recovery movement and works with value options as a trainer, educator, and mental health policy advocate. You can find out more information about um, Ed's work and get in touch with him through his websites, professored.com and recoverycircles.org. That's about all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD, Kasilof, and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by peer-run mental health communities, freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio to help us get broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.